I said. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Let's start up. Let's do a pledge. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Um, if we could do a moment of silence for um, the suffering in the Ukraine right now, I would appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, let's do a quick roll call. I see everyone here except George, who's excused. He had an emergency he had to do in, in Long Island. I do not see Paloma. Uh, is she on the line? I'm oh, here cool. on video. Very good. Welcome. Hi, Paloma. Okay. Nice to see everyone. Um, <clears throat> do we have to say we're doing a hybrid meeting or not? That's interesting. Nope. Yeah. You do not, Mayor, if you, not necessary. Okay. All right, so we've got a community segment uh, which concerns trees. Uh, Chris, are you going to intro? Yes. Um, Thank you. We're, we appreciate that tonight we have uh, Jake DeMassey, owner and certified arborist with Alpine Tree Services, to come to deliver the final report to the City Council on a maintenance program we did on our trees um, at Memorial Park. Um, we received a three-year grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to do this work. It was approximately $36,000 in work. And one of the requirements of the grant is that at the end of the work, um, an arborist has to come and talk about this arborist-driven tree maintenance that we've done. So we did a lot of, um, Jake will, will review what we've done, but this also helps set us up for future grants to then go and replant new trees and, and augment what we have. So with that, I would just introduce uh, Jake DeMassey from Alpine Tree Service. Thank you. Thank you guys for uh, inviting me here today. Um, so basically, very quick, I don't know, can you guys see my screen? It's not up on the board. Ben, can you help share Jake's uh, screen, please? I did click share screen. Can you have it go full screen? Yeah, there you go. Cool. Thanks. All right, thank you guys again for inviting me. Um, you know, just quick presentation and uh, follow up on what we did this past fall and uh, summer, uh, going into the winter of basically working with Mark and, and Mike over there at the town and uh, you know identifying what needs to be done and all that stuff. So we'll jump right into it. Um, this was basically our agenda that we followed when being contacted about the DEC grant and. You know, working with Mark and, and Mike. Um, we met, we discussed that line of the work. I was uh, awarded the bid package that basically outlined everything that Mark and the DEC representative uh, walked out and put into a, to a packet. So that included pruning, removals, uh, stump grinding, and all that stuff. So I'll run through all that, share my recommendations. Uh, ask some questions and basically a little bit of information where you guys can find me and what else we do. So, what did we do? Um, we worked with Beacon DEC to identify hazards and removals. We cultivated a plan to execute the work to be formed, which also included a schedule of when we would be on site. Um, we performed all of our work in house with our staff of arborists that we currently employ full time. We documented the experience, which I'm here to share with you guys today. And uh, I would like to share my findings and recommendations as well. Uh, so first thing we did was tree removal. I have pictured here, it's not on Memorial Park, but this is a picture of one of our cranes that we use for hazardous removals. Uh, this actually did go on, on site for about two days to help with some of the larger stuff. Yeah, there you go. Oh, sorry Thanks, about Pete. that. Okay, cool. Um, these are some of our pictures of material and, and uh, equipment and some of our man manpower that we used while on site. And as you guys can see, that is Memorial Park. Uh, in the left side picture in the bottom right. Um, so this was one of our bucket trucks. We were starting one of the removals that was flagged on the top right corner. That's one of our log trucks. 
that we use that to basically get out all the larger diameter wood that can't be chipped and made into wood chips. And then on the bottom right, that's one of our green turf machines that basically allows us to speed up production as well as save our employees, uh, you know, backs and such and, and pull heavy <coughs> amount of weights and material off the site, but allowing us to not damage the fields or the, the turf over there uh, with the turf tires that is basically like a lawnmower. Um, so that was great, really helped out and was able to accomplish everything that was on that list. Uh, Mark did a great job going through prior. He actually marked out all the trees with their own numbers. So it made uh, myself and my team pretty uh, efficient to identify and perform all this work. Um, talk about pruning. We ended up pruning 27 trees. Um, our objective of pruning was to remove any dead branches that could run the risk of failing. Uh, falling, storm damage, anything that could be landing on pedestrians. Uh, we also performed a light thinning of the canopies, which was removing crossing and rubbing branches. Here's a little bit of pictures of our uh, after. You can kind of see how much more open these canopies are. With removing crossing dead rubbing branches, you're actually increasing the uh, potential of not having storm damage. Um, I always like to use the analogy of like a sail on a sailboat. It will catch a lot of wind, but if you poke some holes through it, it's not going to catch a lot of wind. Um, so we kind of look at that as like the full canopy sail and how it can disperse that violent winds to come through. So in the long run, you guys are less likely to have storm damage from performing this kind of maintenance and work. Uh, in this left side picture, all the way back the last tree, there was a very large limb over there that was cracking uh, right over the field. And we ended up taking that completely back down just to mitigate that from failing. So really good practice to do, and it also gives a really beautiful aesthetic afterwards. So if you guys get a chance to walk through the park, look up, you'll see it's very open and clean. It's, it's, it's beautiful. So uh, Here's another picture. This is one of our spider lifts. Uh, I included this because this is a neat piece of equipment. It actually allows us to track into places where we couldn't fit a bucket truck. This specific piece of equipment only weighs 6,000 uh, pounds, opposed to a bucket truck that actually weighs 26,000 pounds. Um, so it safely puts an arborist in the air to be able to perform work and uh, a lot safer than climbing trees. So a big thing with our company is we'll try to do as much as we can from a basket or a crane without having to put a guy in the air on a rope. Uh, it just takes the, the, the hazard out of our daily job since we do have very dangerous pr professions. Um, so really, really fortunate we have that on, on the team and we actually just upgraded this to a larger 83 foot one. So we're very fortunate for that. Uh, so basically afterwards, me and Mark met um, and discussed really what we should do. And I, I think you guys might have a copy of this, but I sent this out to him a while ago. And it's basically just a little bit in depth of my recommendations moving forward after all this work was done. Um, and I broke it up into pruning, tree care, uh, fertilization, and soil decompaction, which I can get into that a little bit. Um, basically, what we were talking about was pruning is yearly pruning and removal of hazardous trees. That means having eyes on the property at all times, identifying what's a danger, identifying what could be potentially a danger, mm -hmm. um, but also these larger oak trees, linden trees, and maple trees. Every year or so, they will produce deadwood that needs to be addressed as the fibers will actually rot out towards the branch collar attachment and will allow these branches to fall a lot easier than um, I've seen stuff fall, just normal winds, so making sure we go through and remove that stuff is really key to the safety of your guys' residents. Um, and also just re removals. Um, if we can identify something's hollow, if we can identify that there's a defect above, you know, it would safely to come down uh, before it lands on something, a structure, somebody, that would be my recommendation as well. And not saying to run through the park and remove whatever needs to be removed, but have a carefully thought out assessment uh, and weigh out the pros and cons before removing something, which will make room for uh, replanting. So we always look at it as removal is kind of our last option, whatever we can do to save it, and uh, give my professional opinion on, hey, this is our only option, or we have all these different avenues that we can go down. Uh, through our time in the park as well, we noticed some mushroom conks that were growing at the base, and that's why I recommended some routine fertilization. Basically what we do is we go out and we soil test and we send it off to a lab. They send us back a piece of paper with all your diagnostic reports, all your soil levels um, and recommendations on what to treat and how to treat. 
So that would be recommended as well to make sure you guys are maintaining key features because they could be losing a lot of nutrients from not being in like a, a forest floor setting. Um, you know, once you take a tree and put it into a park or an urban setting where the grass is now competing with everything that's in the soil, uh, supplementing that nutritional value of the soil is very key to making sure these trees uh, get their nutrients that they need. Um, we'll have them be less stressed out and a lot more uh, available to exchange oxygen. Now, that kind of goes hand in hand with my, my third line here, soil decompaction. Uh, I want you guys to picture like a, a milkshake on a hot day and you throw a straw in there. You try and get the milkshake up the straw and you can't. It's kind of what we're dealing with when you have soil that's so compacted. You have soil pressure and there's no, um, there's no pore space in the soil. And it eventually is compressing these roots and not allowing for this water to be taken up. So you, it's like pouring water on concrete almost, it just disperses. So we do a practice with a air tool and it's hooked up to a high compressor that actually rototills the soil, that breaks up the soil particles and allows a lot of air and uh, oxygen and water exchange that sometimes for people playing you know, sports or walking, hanging out under these canopies, that soil over time will just keep getting compacted. So uh, that's something I definitely would look into, especially for key trees, because um, you're you know, restricting oxygen, you're also not allowing water to get through. Definitely a, a big thing to do. And then root collar excavation is the same thing. When you have excess soil that's bound up on the root flares, you can start to see stressors that will like, eventually expedite to root rot, um, lack of oxygen exchange, so definitely things to look at. And I'm happy to walk through with whoever to identify this stuff. Um, any questions? Are there any plants that go with tree plantings to help aerate the soil? Do you ever recommend planting something near trees that does that? It will help. Um, I'm not too sure, to be honest. I don't know if there's actually a specific species that will help uh, aerate the soil. Um, I have seen when you put multiple species together, it kind of creates a competition for nutrients and such. But that's a good question. I'm gonna look into that, and I'd, I'd be happy to shoot it over to Mark, and he could share it with you guys. But uh, as of right now, in my knowledge, I don't know about that. So. Um, <coughs> a question about the uh, recommendations. So, the fertilizer. Um, this is obviously a high traffic area for kids and pets. Is the fertilizer that you would use safe for kids and pets? Yep. Is it? A, what, what is it? So we use 100% organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, there are thousands of micro macronutrients in this blend. The company I work with is out of uh, Pennsylvania. Basically, if we ever came to terms to do fertilization, I'd provide you guys with MSDS sheets, and we would just obviously require no one to be like right in our work zone, because you will have a little bit of spill off that sits on the top of the, of the soil, but if we're doing this in a nicely aerated soil, it will leach in the soil within you know, 10, 15 minutes. Mm. Um, so you don't have any kind of uh, period of time where people have to completely stay away from it. Um, typically we like to do fertilization in the rain. It actually helps kind of leach into the mm -hmm. soil and uh, gets a great feeding. But, yep. um, and also the fertilizer we use, the, it's called BioTree and Shrub. Um, it actually bonds the soil molecules, so you're not just getting a fertilization right once, it slow, slowly feeds. Mm -hmm. They call it uh, slow release nitrogen. Nitrogen is the main compound that makes trees grow. So you will constantly have it being fed throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So we recommend a spring and fall fertilizer. Fall helps root growth, and spring helps new shoots grow. So. Um, and, and how about the uh, the decompaction? Does it, is that just aeration, or what, did you say there was a, a chemical or a material you, that you put down? So you guys have two options. Um, we do just a straight aeration, but we also will add in the mineral vermiculite. <laughs> And we also use a blend of biochar, which is basically old woody waste that's burnt and sent to us in a big 50 pound super sack. Mm -hmm. um, what that does, it increases water storage because vermiculite is known to hold water. And the biochar actually, be, um, the biochar will create pore space, which will not allow compaction to happen as easy as possible because it is very time consuming and it's a very dirty process. So it tends to be a little bit more on the expensive side. Um, plus the, your, your material storage that you, that you have to bring in. Um, 
but you look at it as like, okay, you do that, you add in your vermiculite, you add in your biochar, you're now increasing pore space in your soil, you're also increasing your water storage in your soil, and that biochar is gonna help not have the compaction, you know, in years, in two years. You know, also you throw mulch around where we did, it would probably be like less likely for people to be running around on that, um, which would keep the soil less compacted. Okay, thank you. And also just on the fertilizer, I didn't mention it, but we wouldn't just fertilize anything. We would go in prior and do a soil test and basically get a, a cheat sheet of what we're lacking and adjust our fertilization by what, what it is. And it's all organic and natural minerals that are gonna be missing from this soil, so. Great, thanks. This might be a question more for you, Chris, but it sounds like Alpine focused on Memorial, and I know we have other parks and other trees on Main Street. Is, is there a different company that takes care of those? Or I'm, I'm under, trying to understand if, if going forward, if, if there's a plan for all the trees in Beacon. Uh, we're trying to create a program so that these are more regularly planted and maintained. Um, we, we used Alpine a little bit up at the university settlement camp where we, we've, we've programmed some money to clear out some of the deadfalls up by the cabins on the hill at University Settlement Camp Park. In terms of Main Street, we usually do the, the pruning and the planting um, through DPW, and we've um, increased the budgets for all of our tree plantings. So in last year's uh, budget, we put in 28400 for highway, $7,600 for parks and uh, $12,600 for settlement. So we're trying to um, do some cleanup and then continue to plant a number of trees each year. Um, like you'll see down at the waterfront on Red Flynn Drive, we cut down all those old trees that were dying um, and we're gonna be filling the tree wells and then planting on the other side of the sidewalk in the grassy area because those little tree wells just weren't letting the trees survive and, and grow. So we'll be re we have money in the budget to, to do those, to put some new trees on Main Street um, and to plant some trees around the parks as well. I know that Mark Price, our recreation director, will also be um, trying to parlay the work that we did mm -hmm. into the next DEC grant for urban forestry too, so that we can take care of other areas. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I know that we're not talking about the planting, but I am curious uh, what you what you observe as you were over at Memorial Park. So, with the, those all all those trees being roughly the same age and quite mature, and uh, the ground being compacted, um, I, my feeling is that new trees need to be planted in that area. So we, you know, maybe every ten years, uh, you know, have like a, a a new set of trees so that we have trees of different ages. Um, is it possible to plant over there? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you're in great sunlight areas. Some are more sh are more shaded than others, but uh, yeah, definitely replanting would be a, a big key. And I, I didn't speak about that much because I know Mark has talked to me about that. Yeah. And, you know, we currently have the contract with you guys for the remainder of this year for DPW and parks. Um, but in our scope is just actual maintenance and mm -hmm. doing removals, pruning, hazardous stuff. So we don't do any of the planting, but yeah. 100% recommended. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the compaction is something that could be corrected, and uh, it's just something that's going to continue to happen just because of the area that it's in. So, if you guys can do what you can to try and mitigate the compaction, it's very uh, beneficial. Mm -hmm. so and, and we'd like to do plantings every year, so it's, yeah. you know, that each of those areas has replacement trees as the older ones die. Cool. Great. It's very important. So. Yeah. Thank you. And we are Tree City, and we are going to have a little Arbor Day thing oh, on Main Street, which we'll let you know as we get closer. Keep me in the loop for that. I'd love to, love to we'll come do. to that. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Guys, this is all my information. Um, if you guys have our website, my email, my phone number, if any of you guys need it. All righty. Cool. Well, thank you guys for your time. Thanks, Jake. Thank right, you. Thank you. Very it. good. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we have public comment. We got a list. Stash Jankowski. Thanks. Thank you. 
Good evening, everybody. I'm Stas Jankowski, Ward 2. Is this thing on? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Can't hear myself. Um, tonight, I'd like to ask the council, and I'd like to ask Justice as my representative in Ward 2 to be my advocate for a provision that I would like to add to the good cause eviction law. It's very important, very important for property owners, and I think it's even critical for property owners and landlords. In the law, currently, there's a provision that allows a tenant or a landlord to evict a tenant as a good cause if the tenant refuses uh, entry to the landlord for several different reasons, to uh, show the property to a prospective buyer, to show it to a mortgagee or a mortgagor, and I think also to make repairs. What's lacking is a provision that allows the landlord to ask for entry into an apartment or any uh, rented unit to inspect the property, to inspect the apartment for damages, for the kind of condition that the tenant is maintaining it, uh, especially with the possibility of having a tenant having a, a lifelong or perpetual lease, whatever you want to call it. If there's no other causes to evict a tenant, the lease has to be renewed. But we would never know what kind of condition the property is being maintained in if they want to let us in. So if they just refuse, and I think one of the persons that spoke um, at the, one of the meetings here said that someone was dealing drugs out of her apartment and they wouldn't let her in and I guess they got arrested or something, but there, there's all kinds of things that could be happening. I spoke at a, a previous uh, meeting about a tenant that I had that I thought he was good and like a dummy. I didn't check on him. He was a 49-year-old engineer. When he finally moved out, the place was a disaster. There wasn't much damage, but it was just a pit. And it took uh, nine hours or ten hours to clean the place. So that's something that I would like to be able to do to just occasionally with proper notice, 24 hours, whatever, uh, just say, can I come in and, and inspect the property? And I would really appreciate if you could add that tonight. I don't think it's a, a substantive uh, change. Uh, you did last time, you added to the agenda the law and then you passed it. And I'm, maybe Drew can say if I'm correct on this, add the, uh, the uh, amendment to the agenda and then pass it tonight. 15 so, seconds. Uh, one more thing, um, in the procedures, there's nothing in there about us being able to talk to you directly. I thought that was something that you guys would allow us. Uh, it says we cannot specifically ask or speak to a particular person, only in generalities. And I thought that um, you thought it was a good idea for us to be able to criticize you personally with respect. So if you would just check that, for, that's on the agenda to pass that procedure thing. Thank you. Thank you. Am I allowed to ask a clar clarifying question? I, I'm sorry. Am I allowed to ask a clarifying question? To whom? Uh, Stosh. The mayor is. Um, sure, go ahead. Okay. Are, I'm, I'm sorry, are you asking us to add um, to the good cause eviction to, you want ten, uh, landlords to be able to check up on tenants' properties. Um, you want, if they refuse access to check in on the property, you want that to be a reason for eviction? Okay, thank yeah. you. And, and just a point of order, the, the law has passed and the law has been filed with the Secretary of State. So you would need to go through a, a whole nother process of um, and, and Drew can talk about more, but you'd, you'd essentially have to do another public hearing to change that law. Okay. Uh, Dennis Pavlock. Dennis Pavlock, uh, Ward 4. I just want to make, I'm just here for an announcement and I have another miscellaneous comment uh, after that my, uh, this, this uh, uh, thing I want to read here. There will be an informational meeting on May 7th at 10 a.m. at the Memorial Park Pavilion right across from Ron's Ice Cream. That's the pavilion where we'll be at. 
and it's regarding the proposed closing of Castle Point VA Medical Center. I am a veteran. I am a Desert Storm veteran as well. I was recalled back in and three years later after I got out, and I was, for, just so you know for that. So the director from Veteran Affairs, Department of Veterans Affairs, will be on hand to answer any questions. And um, to my knowledge, I know Sue Serino is going to be there. I called a swim in Jacobson's office. We uh, let them know about the meeting. Uh, Antonio Delgado office was called. Um, Sean Patrick Mooney's office was called. So the veterans are coming from Ulster, Orange, Duchess, Westchester, and anybody who's a veteran or anybody who's not a veteran is able is, is you know can can come to the meeting. Once again, informational meeting May 7th, 10 a.m. at the Memorial Park Pavilion right across from Ron's Ice Cream. Thank you. I just have another miscellaneous question to ask. Is there going to be a dog parade this year? I tried to call the Beacon Barkery and ask, but I don't know what, if there's anybody that owns that building or is anybody in that building. Or That's a question. Thank you. Okay. We haven't gotten an application for the dog parade yet. We've received, um, we got the Hocus Pocus Parade and Spirit of Beacon Day, and we're still waiting on others. So I think people are, people are trying to understand what they have the capacity to do now that COVID's dialing down. Okay. Um, that's all that's on the list. I would assume there might be another speaker or two. Teresa? Teresa Kraft Beacon. Let's pull together. Just like the banner read in the early 1900s, celebrating the merger of the twin villages of Fishgill Landing and Matawan. Let's rebuild the Tyrande Bridge back into our historic fold. Let's see how Beacon can help partners restore the Incline Railway and make the mountain accessible to everyone. Like our forefathers before us, we need to capitalize on our natural wonders of the world. We need to give residents and visitors something truly unique only to Beacon. The city needs to go back to hiring local people from our community first to work for the highway department. In the past, they were the eyes and the ears of our streets at all hours of the day versus letting them commute out of town. There's no vested interest in our community and it's showing. Potholes are literally swallowing up our cars, our children, and our sanity. Thankfully, spring has sprung, but so have the stop signs. Why are there so many new stop signs popping up like weeds across the entire city? with no fair warning to the drivers. I understand the need to have stop signs on DePeister Avenue, it's a major thoroughfare, but it should be a four-way stop sign, four-way stops. And it's, as it's set up today, anybody can enter onto the main road from Hiddenbrook and D Davidson without stopping, and that defeats the purpose of safety. Stop signs do not slow traffic down, only enforcement does. I'm very curious what happened to the procedure that this city rarely, if ever, votes on resolutions or revised laws on the same nights as public hearings. Why bother letting the public talk during public hearings if you don't take the time to listen or go back to the workshop to recap? I know it's not a rule or a policy, but in many meetings I've heard it stated repeatedly that's how this city council works. Yet at last week, at the last city meeting, we witnessed a new law rushed into vote. I was at all of these meetings and followed it through the entire, and followed it through. And I've been watching it on social media. Everyone could see large groups from out of the city were pulled into the sway to sway those scales and now are taking full responsibility for getting your new law passed. Beacon was played. Lessons learned. Let's pull together for Beacon. Move it forward. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay. Um, are we online too? We are, Mayor. If you're on Zoom and you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're on a phone, you can press star nine. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll have to join the Zoom by visiting beaconny.gov. And as of now, there are no hands raised. Okay. Mm, yep, no hands. Are, uh, no hands. All right, let's go on. Uh, council reports. 
Uh, want to start down at uh, Molly? Uh, sure. A couple of just quick things. Uh, I want to thank those in Beacon who helped give a first a tour of Ward 1 to uh, the current state senator from across the river, James Scoofus, who is running to be our new state senator in January. And he'll be on the ballot for our uh, our new state senate in November. Um, and uh, another, uh, so I was kind of pleased by people who came out and talked to him, and he seems like a really great fit. If he ends up winning, I'd be pleased to have him in our district. Um, another thing that um, has come up a lot, a couple of questions, is sort of for you, Chris, that a couple, a couple of people have asked about where they can get the direct line phone number for legal services. I didn't know if there was information that you had about about that, um, and you might also be talking, related to that is, you know, good cause eviction, is that in effect, you mentioned it's filed, so I think those two things kind of go together, so if there's anything you can share publicly, rather than field all our individual questions, that might be a better use of your time. Um, and that's it, I'll pass it to Justice. All right, hi, um, where do I start? Um, once again, I, I've mentioned this before, and I want to mention it again, please be wary of scams. I think not this last week, but the week prior, the Highlands Current did a whole, pretty much a whole issue on scams. So they are happening rapidly and regularly around here. Um, so just please be cautious around that. Um, and spring is here, or spring is happening, and I am so excited for things with COVID to be calming down. I'm knocking on wood. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic, and I just want to remind people that like, even though cases are staying low, and I hope they continue to stay low, just be cautious, be careful. Um, Let's see what else. Um, I do want to just let people know of a couple of public forums that are coming up through the Dutchess County Department of Behavioral and Community Health. On uh, uh, Tuesday, March 29th, next Tuesday, um, there is a public forum for service needs for individuals with intellectual and development disabilities. On Thursday, April 14th, there is a public forum for service needs for individuals with chemical dependency. Um, on Tuesday, May 3rd, there's a forum on service needs for children and youth with emotional needs and or chemical dependency. And on May 10th, there is one on mental health service needs for adults. Um, and these are available to the public. Um, and you can check out the Dutchess County website in order to sign up for those and access those as well. Um, lastly, I have been talking to folks. Um, I've met with a couple of folks on, how am I blanking? Dennings Avenue. Um, and uh, Chris, is it possible, I, I don't know the schedule for the paving of roads, but is it possible for some of the potholes and some of that road to get smooth? Um, I've talked to several people that live down there and um, with all of the traffic that goes to the wastewater treatment and the heavy trucks, they said there's a higher volume of trucks and um, yeah, thank you so much. You. Um, yeah, that's all I have for tonight. Okay. Yep. I just want to say a thank you to the um, emergency services personnel, whether it's police, CMS, firefighters, um, everyone who's putting their, their lives on the line to take care of us, um, fire department, and, and also, and I've said this before, the teachers and the mental health care workers and the nurses and people who are working in hospitals who are taking care of us on another level as well. That's it for me. All right. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for who came out to my office hours uh, last Saturday, uh, despite the competition with the St. Patrick's Day parade and a snowstorm. Um, but because of the snow, I, I think it deterred a lot of people from coming out. So I'm going to uh, host office hours again in April, and uh, I'll do so every other month going forward now that COVID seems to be easing up. Um, also, uh, last weekend, I also had a chance to give uh, the state senator, James Scoofus, a tour of Ward 4. Uh, senator Scoofus, as Molly mentioned, um, his district will include, the district uh, that he represents now will include Beacon in the next term uh, because of redistricting. And um, we talked about uh, traffic. We talked about a lot of the projects and a lot of the investments that we want to make in Beacon, Pocket Parks and Community Center and all of these other ideas. And he's really keen to help us out. Um, and he's also pretty keen to help us out uh, with reducing our uh, citywide speed limit. Uh, we're giving us the authority to reduce our citywide speed limit. So it was, a, it was a great conversation. We got to meet some folks. And um, yeah, it's a 
promising to, to hear from him so early. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Chief Frost and Officer Maloney from the police department who this weekend uh, gave me a tour of the, um, of the uh, police department building. Uh, and uh, also I got to ride around in a police car with Officer Maloney and we uh, sat around in Howland and made sure there were no trucks uh, coming down. <laughs> uh, there was not supposed to be any trucks on Howland, so we were keeping an eye on that. But it was a, it was a nice couple, couple hours uh, and uh, I learned a lot. So I just want to thank them. Thank you. Um, Paloma, are you there? Yes. Hi. Um, I would like to echo Dan and thank everybody um, who came to my, my office hours this past Sunday, um, talked to a lot of enthusiastic people about sidewalks, which I know is later on in our, our annual agenda. Um, and I will be um, having the same open office hours every second Sunday from 4 to 6. Um, and I will put on social media where exactly um, those will be. Um, but I will also say that I enjoyed um, walking in the snow on the Parade of Green, so thank you for everybody who, who pulled that together, um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, this will be short. I just want to thank everyone who's here and those who are here online. Um, the last couple of weeks we've been taking a deep breath and catching up on stuff. We've had a number of uh, good meetings that are kind of preliminary to planning and bringing things forward. And I look forward to doing some of those soon. That's all I got. Administrator? Um, so the um, city did uh, contract with legal services of the Hudson Valley for a tenant advocacy program. We've been a little slow getting the signage out, but we will have um, that up posted. Um, if you do need legal services, the number is 845-253-6925. That's 845-253-6953. And that puts you directly in contact with Stephen Mahalik, who is the paralegal assigned to help uh, tenants in the city of Beacon. And we'll, we'll get this out. We've had, I was waiting for legal services to have meetings last week, but the judge to make sure um, they line certain things up before we went full on announcing it. But thank you for the reminder. Um, I do want to remind you all that we will be paving all of Main Street um, towards the end of April. I don't have a start date yet, but as soon as we lock in the contractors that do the milling and then the paving, uh, we'll try to get that schedule out so it's um, you have as much advance notice as possible. And if you do see any children getting swallowed by potholes, please call the Beacon Police at 831-4111. Particularly you, Teresa. We don't want our children swallowed by potholes. Thank you. Chris, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, it, it sounds like good cause eviction is in effect now. You said it was filed. Yes, it's filed with the Secretary of State. So if someone has a question, perhaps calling legal services about their particular case would be a good first step for them yes. at this point? Yeah, and they had asked us for confirmation that it was filed so that they had that additional tool. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Potholes are, are all relative. So <clears throat> in uh, New York City in the 80s, potholes were pretty sizable, uh, and they could swallow up uh, people. There's children. a picture of me somewhere bathing in one. <laughs> uh, I had a we might just plant trees in them and just call it a day. If people do have a pothole on their street, they should go to beaconny.gov and fill out the request for service form. Right? Yes. Right. Okay. yes. And we are, we are trying to get around the city and do the patching. You, you've seen some areas that we've done. We even have them in our, our uh, parking lot. And as the weather gets warmer, then it, we're better able to put hot patch instead of the cold patch, which doesn't last as long. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Um, we got laws and resolutions to do. So um, let's proceed. Uh, the first one is a resolution appointing Sarah Morris uh, to the position of HR director. Chris, uh, let me get a motion and a second. Motion. Second. second. Uh, so that was uh, Molly and Justice. Chris, anything you want to add? I, I would just um, say what I did last week for people tuning in that we, um, for, for the first time, hired a part-time full um, HR director in, in the summer of 2020. Um, when that part-time director left in December, it gave us an option to think about going full-time. 
which we think we have the need for. Um, we interviewed um, uh, three people, three finalists out of more than 50 that applied, and uh, Sarah Morris, who currently works for the town of Wappingers, and of Wappinger and East Fishkill was our top candidate. So we're really excited about having her come on and help bring our, our staffing to a higher level here. I would just add that um, uh, the four communities tried out a, um, a half-time shared HR director, so uh, Wappingers and East Fishkill, and then we did the same with uh, Fishkill. And, um, we, but there really is a lot more work, and what happens is that the city administrator or the finance director or someone else is kind of doing double duty, and even with a half time, we found that uh, that wasn't you know, enough resource. I think this will free up some time uh, for critical staff, which is important. I think Sarah is a, a great asset. Um, we you know, uh, talked to her the first time, and we're very excited. So. Uh, and I think this is, I think we're attracting the right people because I think we're projecting the professionalization of the city and that that uh, through the administrator and through the policies of, you know, what are we trying to accomplish, I think we're getting really good people. So I'm very excited about this. I hope she's feeling better. Yeah, she had a, a pretty bad cold when she <coughs> talked to you last week and she seems a lot better. Okay, uh, any other discussion? When does she officially start? Uh, next Monday. As long as you approve it. Yeah, you have to approve <laughs> it, though. <laughs> Barring we vote yes. <laughs> Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone? Aye. Vote? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. One down. Next one is appointing Esther Jackson to the Conservation Advisory Committee. Um, we got a couple of applications. Um, and uh, this was a recommendation from the committee chair as well, and uh, um, I think Esther would be a good addition, so. And we are queuing up some conversation on the various committees for a future workshop, so I don't know if I get that on next week, but if not, then two weeks from that, that workshop, we'll get it on. All right, can I get a motion and a second? Motion for Esther. Okay, second. All right. So that's um, Ren and Dan, and I can distinguish Ren and Dan. That's pretty easy to do. Uh, any discussion or comments? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Two down. Uh, the next one's authorizing the city administrator to execute an agreement with Miller's Touch Cleaning Services regarding uh, the parks bathrooms. So can I get a motion and a second, and Chris will give us two seconds of Motion. Second. Okay, so that was Justice and Molly. And I can distinguish those two on that side as well. <laughs> so at least tonight, my ears are clear. Chris, anything you want to add? Um, this is a continuation of a program that we restarted last week, where, uh, last year, where we um, regularly daily clean the Memorial Park and Green Street bathrooms. Uh, this company did a fantastic job last year, so I have no hesitation in wanting them back this year. The contract also um, does do a little bit of cleaning up at the settlement camp because we do do weddings at the theater there in the fall, so they prepare it before the season begins and then they, they clean up after each event and that's charged back to the parties using the, the facility. So. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sorry, I had this in my notes for the workshop. Molly, I can you? It. it looks like their proposed contract is for two years, one year and auto renew for one year, but then Mark's letter says three years. I just want a clarification on so which it is. So we're, we're going to modify that. that. That's their draft contract, and we will be drafting our own contract. Okay. We typically do a one-year term with two one-year renewals. Okay. Um, and I would do longer, but I can't guarantee they'll hold the price for five years. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, I heard a unanimous yes. Uh, the next one is uh, also authorizing the city administrator execute agreement, and this one is for the removal and then reinstallation of sol solar panels up above our heads here on the municipal center roof. Can I get a motion and a second? Are you jumping? Oh. Let's uh, go back to the roof. Oh, and then oh, we'll do oh, the there's panel. two. Because I'm not the taking roof. the Sorry. panels off unless you approve the <laughs> yeah, roof. Yeah, all right. So the one before that one is 
is on the roof administrator agreement, but the difference is it's with VAD contractors, and that's for the roof replacement, uh, not the solar panel. So let's do that one first. So is that a motion to see the stars one night? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that a motion to approve? I'll take that as a yes. Bush. And then who's the second? I'll second. That was Molly. So, all right, Chris, you will tell us about VAD and how we're going to see the stars. Um, well, if everything works out, we're not going to see the stars from inside. Um, we um, put in the capital program last year the replacement of the roof. This is the original roof from when the facility was built in 1995-96. So we got a good life out of it. We're going to be replacing the entire roof, um, some of the flashing, and um, th we put it out to bid. We had six contractors bid on it, and the low bid was VAD Contractors Inc. for an amount of $199,800. We had budgeted 305000 so that's good news. Even with the um, solar panel removal and reinstallation, um, we came in well under our budget. So we're recommending that we award this, and we will be, uh, Drew and Nick are drawing up a contract as we speak. Probably right now, in the middle of the meeting, they're working on it. Furiously. Drew's smiling at me. OK, any comments or questions? So this building's 25, 27 years old? 26, I think, since we officially opened it. Yeah. I think it was late 96 that this opened, but it could have been early 97. And then for, for those of you who are interested, there's a plaque out there on the opening of the City Hall uh, building, and Chris White's name is on there. Uh, I tried to get it off. <laughs> this was uh, one of my first votes was to approve the building of this building. And it was just like, I don't want to do this. Um, but it was a done deal. And uh, I've always had a preference for it being on Main Street. And in fact, the building next to Mays Hook and Ladder uh, was the old city hall. Uh, obviously, a 60s design building, kind of a classic, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, any other questions or comments on this one? No. OK. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that's VAD on the roof replacement. So now the next one is, and I'm looking for a motion in a second, on an agreement to remove and then reinstall the solar panels. Motion. Second. Okay, that was Molly and Wren. Well done. All right. <laughs> I don't even have to look up. <laughs> Anything I would add? Um, I would just say the reason that we don't have a vendor's name in this is we're waiting on our third quote in order to... S for public works projects between 5,000 and 35, we need um, three written quotes. I have two. So we know that as of when we published, the low quote was 23,160. So if we, we did get another quote in um, today that's lower. Um, so what we're saying asking is just for you to authorize me to sign the contract for up to the amount that we had last week, and we're already below that. So we'll see what the next quote comes in. The reason we did this is because it's kind of a time pinch to get those off um, before the, the roofing job begins. Yeah, that, that was my one question, is why are we being asked to vote on something we don't even have a name? I, I don't profess to have any expertise on solar paneling, but just wanting to clarify that for the public. Yeah, it was. it's it's a timing issue, Molly. Normally, I wouldn't. I would have brought you a name and a number. I knew a number that I wasn't going to exceed, so I just am asking for the authorization to sign up to that number, and the contract will have to be reviewed by our, our attorneys, as usual. And it'll be for the low bid. Yeah, so we have a bid that's $1,600 less than the one we had last week. Um, just a <clears throat> point of information, didn't, if we approved this money in the budget, do we need to do this vote? Or is this approving a contract that doesn't exist yet? It's approving a contract that doesn't exist yet. Well, it's, it's it was in your capital budget. You, you have to approve both. So think of it like a bucket. The capital program sets up the bucket in which you put money. And then in order to take the money out, we bring you a contract like the, the roofer, mm -hmm. the solar panel. So we were normally, we would have done this um, differently, but I'm, I'm trying to get these panels off so they can start the roof job in April. What's the risk? Is there risk? 
Yeah, there's always risk. I mean, the risk of having solar panels on the roof is that somebody inadvertently. I meant, sorry, risk of us approving this without a contract and. Oh, I was uh, taking that bigger. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, because the thing is, I would have brought you tonight the one quote I had. It's a responsible vendor. They were actually the installer. And then we, um, we realized we needed to go get two other quotes. Okay. Initially, I didn't realize the value of this contract. I thought it was a few thousand dollars. And then when I saw the actual proposal that we got through the Climate Smart Coordinator, I, I went back in the procurement policy, and it's clear we have to do three written quotes. Would yeah. you ever choose the not the lowest one? Yeah, if there was a vendor that was debarred or had a had, you know, uh, some kind of really bad experience that we were aware of. But all of them, the the two we've gotten are both um, high standard NYSERDA, um installers. So I didn't see a quality difference between them. There's only a slight price difference. Uh, yeah, Ren, there's categories of contracts and some things like bulk purchases, you have to take the low bid. Yes. Others, you have some flexibility. Professional services, you don't. Uh, are those the three buckets? Yeah. You don't have to take the low bid. Yeah. And then you have a little bit of wiggle room in your procurement policy. So if, if the entity that isn't the low quote was from Dutchess County, you could act and there was a differential of only 10% you could then award. Unfortunately, the, con the, the entity that put this in was from Ulster County. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's a risk. Um, you know, we'll just say we'll go down from this number. Mm -hmm. it, it'll either be 23,000 or less. And right now it looks like it's going to be less. Yeah, I, I would say from a government point of view that if Chris was bringing us lots of these that like, oh, don't worry, I'll get you later stuff, that might give me pause. So this gave me pause, especially the second one where I was like, wait, I'm being asked to like, it seemed particularly, potentially not open, but I feel like this is the one, the, the reason makes sense, so I'm fine with it, but I think it's a good point just to pause on so the public doesn't feel like, wait, what's exactly going on here? And yeah, and I, I think we would have uh, queued this up in advance if I was aware of at the time how much this was going to be. I didn't see a number on this project until really recently, and then I knew I had a little bit of catch up to do. Because if it was, it was, I thought it was below 5,000, in which case I just need one quote. I think someone online, maybe Drew, did you, were you going to say something? Uh, that was me. I was just going to say that we're going to make sure we have a um, contract in place before any of the work moves forward, which will include the required insurance, um, the standard beacon standard insurance requirements, certificates of insurance, indemnification language. So we'll make sure all the bases are covered. What's important here is that we have um, an amount not to exceed and that we know the scope of the work and that's not changing. But I agree this is not something that, you know, happens frequently or should happen frequently. It is just a timing issue in this case. But the scope of work won't change and the amount um, won't exceed the amount in the resolution. Okay, everybody good? Okay. Um, I have another question. Why was it more than you anticipated? Did you because I, mean, I, I didn't realize he's how. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's be clear. Mic drop. <laughs> um, I mean, the reason I'm asking is because this is a field where there's a lot of competition. Yeah, right? I, I guess I just didn't realize. Firstly, I didn't realize how many panels we up, had up there. Mm -hmm. Initially, I thought we just had the one, but there's two um, pockets of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't realize how much. It, I thought they were just taking this off, and it was a simple reinstall. Yeah, it, I, it's not that expensive considering there, there's quite a number of panels mm -hmm. and it's up a bit, so you have to have a ladder, you know, a ladder truck and mm -hmm. um, a lift. You gotta spend more Thank time you. on the roof. Yeah, <laughs> I'll get up there someday. Okay. I, I guess I have one more question too. Sure. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, will the company, whoever it is that's uninstalling and reinstalling them, will they be storing them as well? Yeah, they're, they're going to have to put them somewhere safely during the um, week or so that we do the, the um, roof job. What I think they'll do is bring like a pot or something that they can put on site that's secure and will keep it from, you know, anything from happening. Uh, 
I, I know if I speak, someone's going to ask another question. So, we good? <laughs> all right. I'm good. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank, anyone opposed? Thank you all. Um, all right. Uh, last one of our resolutions is adopting City Council Rules of Procedure, which we adopted at the beginning of the year, but we had some changes. Can we get a motion and a second? Motion. Second. So that was Justice and Molly. Um, I will say that um, I, had a, I sent you all a couple of like minor insertions, uh, and if you um, uh, humor me, I'll just take you through what those are. Sure. Uh, so. So I did a read. I thought it was great. I had no issues. Um, I, I kind of mentioned to you this was done uh, in one of my off periods. I was off council during this period, and I was, and I went back and read these. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, so you know, being uh, interested in getting that done, I think is great. Uh, the first one is is in that uh, opening statement about what we're you know believe in. I just thought we should add something about being committed to First Amendment free speech, um, and that's all that is. Um, then the second one was if we get written comments, um, we need to be able to identify who the person is. I don't think it has to be signed, but we need to be able to identify the person, right? Because we've gotten some that are just anonymous, and I think that doesn't qualify. So they should be written and, I don't know, a name, uh, something like that. That was the second one. And then the third one was um, the one we added about Zoom. Um, so the only issue with the Zoom cha uh, um, channel for public speaking is there's up to 8 billion people on that channel. And so if we ever have to prioritize, I'd like that to be the way that we prioritize. So that's what that was meant to be. And then uh, the last one was um, in terms of the audience and respectfulness, uh, it was just adding that you know, in, in the audience needs to be respectful and in no way somehow um, discourage free speech, right? To make anyone feel intimidated, to make anyone feel like they can't speak their mind, or even not to speak at all. all right, so those are the only ads, and I, I just thought otherwise it'd look great. And I don't, I don't find these essential either. I think they're pretty minor, but whatever you all think. Um, I'm, I'm personally fine with Lee's additions. I think that's great to call out free speech and, and make something that, that works. So, um, and I, I don't feel that they're substantive enough that, that I feel bad about the public not having a chance to take a look at them, but also I know that if the public feels strongly and differently that we can bring this back up against, un unlike a public hearing and a law change, it's, it's not as onerous a process. Um, if someone raises a good point we want to bring back. But I'm curious to hear from others about how they're feeling. I'm just going to give a thumbs up. <laughs> I'm happy with all of the changes, including the mayor's changes. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about uh, the comment tonight about, what is it, I guess is it part E, the speaking to any one member directly. I think I'm inclined to keep this the way that it is because I think the point of coming to city council is to speak to the the board, to the to the overall board. It doesn't mean that someone can't reference an individual member. Um, but the idea is that people aren't coming here to talk to me or to Justice or to Lee. The idea is that they're coming here to mm -hmm. speak to the entire council and they can reach us and by other means, right? Right. Okay. But it doesn't mean that they can't talk yeah. about us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm good with that too. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think we would need a uh, motion to add these oh, right. changes, okay. the changes. Um, that were not in the one that we did in workshop. Is that right? Do we just do a motion or to amend? Yeah. Um, so are the ones that were in workshop that were changes, that's what was brought forward here. And so it's only the additions mm -hmm. that I just mentioned would we'd have to add. So we'd have to look for a motion in a second to add those. Is that all right? I'll make a motion to add the mayor's changes. Okay. Second. So a motion and a second. Um, and again, I can go over them or, you know, we're good. You had a look at them? I think we're good. Um, Paloma, uh, do you have anything you want to ask about or add? Um, I, I guess I'm reflecting on, on one of the changes that the mayor pulled in about um, making sure that um, nobody is hindering somebody else from being able to speak what they need to. And I'm just a little bit concerned about sort of who the arbiter is that of that or how we decide 
exactly what that is. Because um, in my mind, we've articulated part of the purpose of the whole um, the whole document is laying out a framework in which everyone can be heard, which is item number one. Um, and I'm not sure how that last item will be operationalized. Um, but I also sort of, as we discussed in workshop um, last week, um, this is a very much a living document and I think is largely determined by the people who sit on this council at this moment and the people who sit on the council at this moment. I'm not too worried about um, that becoming a burdensome clause. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I would add, Paloma, is that the words that are there are still there, which is respectful and shall refrain from comments and gestures. None of that has changed. The only thing it's saying is for what purpose? Because right now, that respectfulness is only about the orderly progression of the meeting. It's like, okay, I guess that's okay for the orderly progression, but frankly, what's important is that we hear everyone, and that's why I added that phrase, right? That was the only thing I was after. And in terms of how we would interpret, obviously the, <clears throat> the meeting's got a chair, the chair makes an interpretation, and this body has the opportunity to, you know, question that and to alter that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's unchanged, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Anything else? Please. Um, I, I will permit it, it because it's such a small crowd. Um, we're not, it's not a public hearing, but if you could be quick about it, Stosh. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Um, the comment is that I'm just wondering if it's possible to limit the speakers on public comments and public hearings to only Beacon residents and those that work here. We had this traveling Wilbury show for the last uh, few meetings where there was all people from all out of town, from who knows where, coming in to advocate for a particular cause. So I don't know if it's possible to limit to only Beacon residents and Beacon workers. So thank you, Stosh. Um, thank you. Actually, the one comment I made here about when, if we ever have to prioritize, um, if someone turns up in person, uh, I think we hear everyone, uh, but on the Zoom side, uh, said, I only wrote, if we have to prioritize, the priority would be given to Beacon residents. And I think that's the way you address it. I don't think we want to turn off that if there's time and there's room. Um, but, you know, if there's 100 hands out there, uh, I really would like to know which ones are Beacon and make sure we cover those, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, you know, we've had, um, I've seen, like, advocacy groups come in from out of, you know, outside of Beacon, um, not in recent years, but just over the years, uh, come in and you know illuminate us about a an issue that we never you know that nobody ever thought about before, and we can take it up or not. But it's helpful to hear new ideas. So. Yeah, yeah, I'd certainly prefer them to be here because it's reflecting their commitment, you know, and the you know it's pretty easy to get online to make you know comments. Which, as I said, the only thing I suggested that we do is is establish an upfront prioritization if we ever need it. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's only because there's two of you. I know you like and Clark. Clark. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm always proofreading. Sorry. I just want to say something. All right. Your number seven, your order of business, does not follow tonight's agenda. And I believe you said to always have the community segment first before public comment. Thank you. So I'll take that up afterwards. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not getting that. We did the community segment before public comment. Yeah, we did. I know that you're looking at Yeah, that's correct. It says public comment before community segment, and we actually run it the other way. We do. Right? On page two at the bottom in item seven, right? D and E are not how we run it. So if I could ask for an amendment, I'd like to switch that. Yeah. The, the reason for that is oftentimes the community segment is somebody from an external party and I like to be able to say I'll get you in and I'll get you out. Yeah. Yep. yep, thank you. So um, we're still looking for a motion and a second to adopt thank amendments you. and then can we add this uh, change of uh, D&E, the public comment so community I'll, segment? I'll withdraw my motion to add, change, the, to add your edits and I'll introduce a new motion 
to add the mayor's edits and the yeah. city administrator's ed edits to number seven. Okay. Is that right? Teresa said that'll do. I'll, I'll second what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can uh, Teresa so vote on this, please? <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, I think we should do an honorific thing tonight. All right. Remind you, it's my birthday. So we now have the <laughs> correct motion in second. <laughs> Any other comments? All in favor on the amendments? Say aye. 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 Okay. aye. Now we're voting on the rules of procedure as amended. Uh, and I think we had a motion and a second on that, yeah. right? So now are we ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Okay, now the ever important approval of minutes. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes of March, sec March 7th. Motion. That's Molly. <laughs> all right, I will second this, um, which I'm allowed to do. Um, there's a, a reference in the minutes to an executive session at the end, but I don't think we had one. I don't know if that matters, though, if that's just a form thing. She's reading them. Yeah. That's good. It is good. We'll take it off. Okay. All right. So uh, motion to approve the minutes with a uh, ministerial uh, striking of the words executive session. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all second opportunity for public comments there is one party in the room hey clerk um that can certainly speak that hasn't spoken before welcome oh tell us your name and address hi it's uh, clark gebman to wilson street and beacon um a little housekeeping here i chris i um, have uh, read a little bit about you and uh, your reference to your history here and um it's comforting to know that some of the history. Um, I was your neighbor. Here. I lived at Roundtree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, um, I was really concerned about this rental discussion, and and I was appalled at the at the lack of um, um, real estate um, understanding of, of real estate finance. By, by the council, um, and 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 because it's so critically important to the housing crisis, um, there are um, essentially. Um, uh, don't pay attention to what I gave you. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm <laughs> distracting you, and I, I didn't mean to. But the, the, you can look at housing crisis from so many different angles, and um, I'm a professional and. And Lee is certainly very, very well educated on this on the subject, as well as a uh, uh, council, uh, 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 George. Um, uh, the, the, they they took a side in the position, and they discussed the position from a very, very learned real estate um, uh, understanding, which takes years to accumulate. Now, I, as a former commercial appraiser in the state, I can tell you that I'm certainly available to to discuss this with you at length in terms of how the economics works. But I will go bold tonight to say that the lack of four family housing in Beacon is the single biggest failure of the city government of Beacon against resolving the housing crisis. The second issue I will raise is that land values have accrued so drastically that I would claim that I have one third of developable land in terms of ownership of land. Which translation means, if I wanted to help the city of Beacon and help your understanding, I could tell you that I would like to put five buildings that are really five separate townhouse type buildings, three stories tall, 6,000 square feet apiece, eight parking garage 15 uh, seconds and do it and, and, and not require any principal payments on mortgage with the only thing you would pay is four percent interest on the notes while you carry them and I, no money down 100 homes because that's the economics of it so if you really want to help people live in beacon then you need to adopt a real estate vocabulary that is commensurate with the needs of the citizens of the city. 
Thanks, Clark. Okay. Um, Mayor, you currently have no hands raised on Zoom for speakers. Okay, so I'll, I'll call the second opportunity for public comments um, closed, and I thank everyone, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion, second. Molly and Ren, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you all. Have a happy birthday. Thanks. Happy birthday, Dan.